my name is Julie Lang. I have a food blog called Twice as Tasty, and I teach cooking workshops and um, do some other projects all related around the food that comes off of the blog. If there's an overarching theme to the blog, it's how to use real ingredients to make good food year round. And uh, one of the things that I do a lot of for my personal use and for the blog is pickling. So we're going to talk about a whole bunch of different types and styles of pickles today. And mostly I just want to make sure that I can answer as many questions as possible, do my best to anyway, from you guys um, to get you all started in pickling, or if you're already picking, pickling, to get you to doing more and feeling more comfortable with it. Um, one of the things that we're doing here at Free the Seeds this year is they've got a real focus, you've probably seen it all around, on the community food system and how there's a, we're trying to encourage the growth of our community food system here in the Flathead Valley and um, make it really clear that it's something that is everybody is involved in. For example, all of you in this room are already part of the system now because you eat. And if you eat locally, even better. And when you start growing your own food and you start pickling and you start sharing what you eat and then of course if you're growing and eating those things you hopefully start with some composting and um, recovery of the food cycle, then all of a sudden you're immediately part of the entire process of the community-based food system just on your own. So the more of us that can do that together and share and contribute and give what we know to each other, the better our local food system is going to be and the stronger it's going to be, which is super exciting to see how many people are here today that are now more involved in all of that. And like I said, pickling is a huge component of that because these pickles all here are from produce that I grew, and so that's my first start of the system in the production. I'm a, I'm a producer now, and I process them in one way or another, so now I'm in the processing part. Um, I do share them. I did not come prepared, unfortunately, to share today, <laughs> but I do share pickles, so I'm distributing them, and uh, I'm eating them, and other people are eating them, and then at the end of the day, all of the seasonings and things that uh, that may not potentially get used up end up in my compost and back in my process system. So right there, you're looking at this entire community food system. But the pickles in particular are one of my favorites. Um, I'm I'm a huge fan of anything tart, tangy, vinegary, salty, brined. Not necessarily salty, salty, but that brine flavor. And so the more I pickle, the more I find things that I love to do with pickles. The ones I brought today are some of your perhaps non-standard pickles, but they're ones that you can do even this time of year if you've got your storage veg. Um, these are all carrots, and I've got quick pickles, refrigerator pickles, some fermented, and some processed ones. And I've also got uh, quick pickles, fridge fermented, and processed um, from red onions. And the ones that have been processed, I did last season, or actually the season before on a couple of these jars, the other ones, the ferments and the fridge and quick pickles, I all started last week. So they were based off of veg I had in storage that I harvested from, from last fall, my storage onions and my storage um, carrots. And um, this one actually has some apple in it. That's also uh, from something that I had stored. And so um, even in midwinter, I'm able to come up with, with some pickled produce. The beauty of pickling is that it lets you preserve any low acid food safely. So the food safety is hugely important when you're going to the shelf storage stage where you gotta keep everything shelf stable because you're not refrigerating it, you're not doing anything else to preserve it beyond that. The low acidity thing is really the most important part of pickling because most of what we pickle are vegetables and most vegetables are low acid. And if you don't know what that means, we're talking about a pH number and it's kind of confusing because the lower your number on the pH scale, the more acidity in your vegetable. The higher your number on the pH scale, the less acidity in the vegetable. And vegetables are almost on the low acidity, high pH number end of things. Berries, fruit, a lot of your fruits are on the low end, but almost all your vegetables are on the high end. Um, the exceptions to the vegetables are pretty much ones that are on the cusp. So tomatoes, tomatillos, they're on that cusp of are they low acid, are they high acid, which means you still got to play with this game of getting your pH balance right in order to preserve them properly and in order to get them to pickle. Um, but 
once you do that, then you're looking golden with all of these jars. So it really is about just nailing that number and getting it right. And the way, the easiest way to nail the number and safely store all your low acid vegetables is to add acid. And you can do that through uh, vinegar, is the, one of the easiest ways to do it. You can also do it through salt. A salt brine is going to basically create the acid for you that you need to preserve that vegetable. And um, there are, if you've ever looked at any of these processes and doing any pickling and canning and things on your own, you know there's a ton of books, there's a ton of recipes, there's a pile of information out there. And they can be all over the map when you start to compare them as far as how much vinegar, how much salt, how much of everything they're putting in each jar. A lot of that's because every fruit and vegetable has a different pH number to start with. So if you're doing something like a tomato that's on the cusp, you may only need a tablespoon or two of lemon juice and you're safe to put it in your boiling water bath and you're good to go. If you want to put carrots and cucumbers in your water bath, you're going to need a whole lot more acidity in there because their pH number is make, makes them a lower acid food. So that's the game we're playing when we pickle, is how do we come up with something we can keep in our jar and, um, and then come up with a flavor that we love. Obviously, too much salt, too much vinegar, you're, you're not going to want to eat it anyway. So um, what we're looking at here are a bunch of different styles of pickles that really let you do um, just about everything. A lot of people say, oh, I, I would love to make pickles, but it's such a huge process. It takes hours. I've got to get up the water bath canner. No, no, no. These pickles here, they're ready to eat in 15 minutes. You're good to go. So it really depends on what it is you're trying to achieve with your jars of pickles and what it is whether you're trying to preserve them for long term or whether you're trying to just make something sharp and vinegary and fun and different to put on the table at dinner. So I like to start with quick pickles. They're called that because that's exactly what they are. They're quick, they're easy, they take very little time to make, and they're ready to eat super quickly. I usually recommend trying to get them so they have a chance to sit for about 15 to 30 minutes at a minimum. Um, these quick pickles, I actually, because of my schedule, I made them, uh, this was on the 24th, so what we're looking at, close to a week. So they're kind of at the end of the time frame where I would normally want to keep them. I'd normally want to have them eaten by now. And part of the reason for that is because to pickle them quickly, I've made them really thin. So these are red onions that have been pickled. And if you look at the size of these strips, they're quite thin and small. And so they absorb the smaller the, the pieces, the more they'll absorb the produce, the uh, vinegar, more quickly. And the same thing with the carrots and the apples. These guys, you can see, these are in full-on sticks. They're still a refrigerator pickle. These are sticks as well. These guys, we're talking super thin pieces of carrot that we've got there. My favorite way to achieve that is this handy tool called a mandolin. And basically, it's a, it's a cutting board. It's got a little spring on it that you change here, and it changes the angle. And you can run your produce on. It's got the sharp blade there definitely recommend a glove if you are going to use one because the way that process is going to work is you're going to come over here and you're going to go scrape 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 to the end of your vegetable and the tips of your fingers but it's really nice for quick pickles because you can get everything ultra thin I'm talking your Sunomo before sushi with those really thin cucumber layers these kinds here the onions there they're also really nice if you're doing bigger pickles um, for longer term storage or bigger batches and bigger slices because you get them even. And when you're doing a jar of pickles, the more um, you can keep everything the same size in your jar, then the better consistency you're going to have with what you produce out of it. So, um, so these quick guys, they're super thin. These ones that are the fridge pickles, they're still pretty thin. They're meant to be in the fridge for a little bit longer. But some of these are a lot bigger pieces here. You know, I've got a pretty good size round there. Still did it with the mandolin. But um, it's going to take a little bit longer in the jar. And I do that intentionally. So if I have it thin and I want to eat it quickly, I get my crisp crunch. If I leave it a little bit thicker and I'm going to let it sit longer, I still get my crisp crunch. Part of what I'm going after there. 
the fermented guys can be all over the map. This is, um, oh, and so these guys, they're both vinegar pickles, and I used red wine vinegar in both of these because um, I wanted to really enhance that red color from the pickled onions. This guy, it's a salt brine pickle, and so there's no vinegar, there's no added color from the vinegar, but what I did add were beets on top. So if you look at the jar, you can kind of see toward the bottom that it's not as colored because the beet's sitting up here and it's leaching all that color down and adding that color to the jar. So you end up with those really bright, pretty pickles out of there. These ones, I call these barely fermented carrots because they hardly ferment long at all. I've shaved them already, so they're super thin. I did them with a peeler. You can do them on the mandolin as well to shave the, the uh, length of them. But um, they are a really good way, the recipe's up on my blog, it's a really good way to practice starting with ferments because it gets you used to the idea of this is my salt and my ferment, this is my weighting, I'm pressing them down. This guy, as you can see, got a little jar inside here. He's acting as my weight to press down what's inside my pickle jar. These guys, I initially weighted and pressed them down and then I fluffed them up in the jar so that uh, they looked a little prettier when I walked into class with them and they weren't all compressed. These are awesome on sandwiches and things like that and because they've already been sliced thin, pull them out, spread them on, they're good to go. It takes me an extra two seconds to add them to my grilled cheese or whatever else. So briefly recap, super quick pickles, 15 to 30 minutes, they're ready to go. These guys, you let them sit in the fridge 24 hours, they're probably good to go. Your ferments, my barely fermented ones, they hardly sit very long at all. This guy here, I started him a week ago. He's going to go four to six weeks before he's ready, which is more of a typical brining time for any of your ferments. And then the process guys, they went through a canner. And so they're sealed up. They'll stay sealed up until I go to eat them. They're a little less crisp because they've been processed, although there's some things you can do to make them crisper as you go. But they're going to sit on my shelf, and I don't have to add them to my refrigerator, which is already very full reinforced shelving to hold on my pickles. Any questions so far? What's Julie, you've got different types of lids there. Yeah, so these ones are sealed. Mm -hmm. So they've got the sealed canning lids on that you need to keep them safe. These ones are plastic screw on lids. Balls made these guys, some of the other companies do. I've started converting to the plastic for a lot of my pickles because I found that um, what I used to do was this. This is an old canning lid, so I can't use it again for canning. Right. Still in good shape, lid and ring. If I leave the pickle in the fridge a long time, it'll start to the vinegar or the salt will start to eat into that, which doesn't sound like it's probably a very good thing I want to happen. So I'll still do that for my quick pickles, but I found that for my ferments or ones that are gonna sit in the fridge for more than a couple of weeks, I've kind of transitioned to these plastic ones. This guy here, is the actual active ferment. There's a ton of options out there now for tools you can use for fermenting and getting them going. A lot of times when I ferment, I'll just take a plastic bag, fill it with the salt brine, and set it inside. You're, what you're trying to do is get the all of your produce weighted under the uh, level of the liquid to ensure you don't get any mold growing on there. So um, I'll do that a lot of times. I've started doing with the little canning jar inside as a weight which works really well on these small batches. And then this is a fermenting bubble, and of course I spilled it just before you all showed up so it's off balance. But you keep liquid in water in here, it caps into here, and now I've got an environment where there's no air inside. And at the same time, it's able to bubble out of here so that as the ferment gets active, if you've ever had a really active ferment and a full jar, it can overflow that'll prevent that from happening. Um, this is an old school style of using a fermenter. I brought it in today because you can pick them up at Withy's. You can get them locally really easy. There's a ton of different fermenting options out there um, for ones you can buy, ones you can uh, do it yourself at home. The main thing is to keep it clean, whatever you decide to throw in there, and keep an eye on it. And make sure that if it does start to develop uh, yeast or anything like that, you're So 
that's kind of a little overview of what we've got sitting here. Talk briefly about pH. I'm happy to expound upon that and the little the sciencey things more if need be. But mostly, just want to see what it is you guys have questions about for, for pickles and pickling. Where can we help it? Yeah. What's the shelf life of the canned ones? Uh, the one used in the canning. And through the canning kettle? Right. Um, your best use is within a year. Okay. You'll get the best flavor and um, nutrients and all that stuff out of it. Is the things will start to age over time, especially if they're exposed to light and stuff. Okay. That said, as far as shelf life and how long you can have it and still open it, years. Um, this guy here uh, got lost in the back of the canning shelf. He's from 2015. And he'd be totally fine to open up. He'll probably be a little softer than a batch I've canned in the current year. They'll start to soften, the veg will start to soften up there, particularly for the pickles, they'll soften. Mm -hmm. you, mentioned some, you mentioned some ways to um, make things crisper. Like I have yeah. some pickles that I've done in canning and they didn't stay very crisp. Yep, yeah, so when you think about what you're doing to your produce, we're trying to take something that's fresh and crisp and awesome, and it's, it's done doing its thing. It's ready to be eaten. Now it's for our benefit. We're trying to extend its life. And so everything that's built into the plant says, I'm done. I don't have to stay crisp and juicy and wonderful anymore. So you have to do what you can to, uh, to hold that forward. And um, a lot of the problem with the canning process is you're adding heat. And that's immediately going to soften it. You know, you take a cucumber, you throw it into a bowl of hot water, it's going to soften up. And so you are just going to get some loss overall in crispness. So if you want to keep your crispness in your canned ones, there's a couple things you can do. Um, I am a fan of a cold pack. If you know what that means for canning, you can hot pack your, your produce and everything you put in there, which means everything that goes in your jar is hot. Is hot sorry. Or you can cold pack it where you've got a hot jar, you've got a hot brine, you're pulling over it, but the vegetables themselves are at room temperature. And so you start there, you're getting just that little bit of extra time before they go in the canner and they get heated. Um, the other thing that you can do with cucumbers and zucchini in particular, which is what a lot of people are trying to keep crisp in a canner, is you can pasteurize them instead of boiling water bath. And it sounds kind of counterintuitive, and I'm not a scientist, so I don't know quite all of the science behind it. But if you pasteurize them, it's at a lower temperature for a longer period of time, whereas a boiling <coughs> water bath is a shorter period of time, but a higher temperature. And somehow, the combination of less temperature but longer time keeps things crisper. They only rec it's only recommended by the USDA and the National Association for Food Preservation for zucchini and cucumbers. But those are the ones that we're mostly trying to keep really crisp and struggle with in the jar. Um, so when you say pasteurize, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. So if you're used to doing a, a water bath canning, it's exactly the same process. Do your jars, fill them, put on your lids, stick them in your canner, but instead of sticking them into boiling water, you're going to stick them into a canner that's at a temperature of 185. And the easiest way that I know of to make sure of that is to have a big old thermometer that you shove in there with it, unless you've got one built into your unit. Because you want to keep it between 185 and 80, or 185 and 190 the entire time it's in the canner, which is 30 minutes. And if it goes below that, you need to bring it back up and add that extra minute for that time. So it's a little more intensive in terms of watching it, mm -hmm. but once you get used to doing it, get used to what your stove settings are and how it's gonna process it, then you end up with um, this pasteurized unit that's gonna be just as safe and shelf stable as the one that goes in your boiling water bath, but you're gonna have a crisper pickle inside of your jar. And for us here, if you think about it, it's really not, it seems like a long time, you're like, oh my goodness, 30 minutes in the canner, that seems like a long time. But we already live above sea level and have to add time to anything we process and can. So at our elevation, we're adding an extra 10 minutes. Um, if you live anywhere around here, it's usually 10 minutes that you're adding on to whatever is the published time. Most pickles you have to process for 15 to 20 minutes. So you're almost there already. 
I have not tested it in places that are at sea level to see if my pasteurized versus my <laughs> boiling water bath, I, maybe my Christmas variation changes there. But, uh, but yeah, so, so that's my favorite way for doing them in the canner. And to be honest, um, the more I do ferments, the more I shift to that in my pickling because you just get that much crisper because they never see heat. You get all the added other benefits, of course, too, with probiotics and all those kind of things, but they never see heat, so they stay crazy crisp compared to what you're going to get out of a, a can or at home. What else we got? You could try to ferment something and mm -hmm. fight. Is there a way to fight yeast once it starts? You know, not bubble, but that yeast. Yeah, the, so the yeast is part of the process, um, and that's basically, it's, it's going to develop because your ferment's working. That's a good sign of it. Um, the best things I know of to do is you're mostly trying to um, keep the balance and keep the ferment going and not let the yeast take over. So um, this is one way to do it. If you've got things really well sealed with an airlock, you will sometimes find, depending on the vegetable, you get less yeast. I get far less yeast on carrots and um, onion than I do on cucumbers. Those things just want to develop yeast like crazy. So when I've got an active ferment going with those, I'll be skimming the yeast off the top and um, then replacing with fresh brine as I need to. But um, in the end, I try to keep, I try to do as little disturbing as I can of that and keep the original brine in there and let it work through. If I'm gonna then store them for a while, if I'm like, okay, I've fermented, you know, I'll do a, a lot of half gallon jars of, of pickles for ferments. If I fermented six half gallon jars, I'm not gonna eat them all straight away the ones that are going to sit longest, I'll um, refresh their brine and store them in a, in a fresher brine without the yeast. So, yeah. What else? So with what I was talking about with pH and stuff, is that making sense to everybody? I'm not sure. I forgot to ask the question at the beginning here about who was totally new to this and who's <laughs> well experienced. Um, but um, something that I get asked a lot as it relates to pickles is, how do I know? How do I know that what the pH is? How do I know whether this recipe is good? You know, what should I be doing? I just know there's a lot of rules, and I'm afraid of breaking them, but it's like nobody's told me what all the rules are. Um, so the pH is really what all of those rules are revolving around. Yes, there's rules about clean, keeping clean and doing those kind of things. But in all honesty, is Kevin West, who's an incredible cookbook writer and, and food preserver, says, if you can feel comfortable cooking chicken in your house, which is so prone to salmonella, keeping you things clean enough to do pickling and canning shouldn't be any problem. I mean, really, when we're talking about cleanliness, it's stuff that we're already doing already. But the other rules of canning, most of them revolve around pH, because you're trying to take a food, particularly canned food, but even the other ferments and pickles, you're trying to take a food that doesn't want to sit around that long and make it sit around longer. And if you don't do it properly, then you run the risk of, the big boogeyman is botulism, mm -hmm. but you run the risk of, of it not turning out well and potentially making you sick. Um, the risk isn't as great as people think, but it is definitely there, and it definitely should make us aware of the fact that we need to be conscious of this. And it all really revolves around this pH. The magic number there is 4.6. 4.6 for food preservation is your number where you say this is high acid, this is low acid. All your vegetables and your melons and a bunch of tropical fruits, they're all going to be a number that's higher than 4.6, which means you can't process them safely without doing pickling or some other acidification process. Your berries, your fruits, most of those are below. So you're looking at other factors with what you're adding into it for canning and preserving. So knowing where that pH is, is kind of the important part. Unfortunately, it's kind of hard to tell. You can't just look at a vegetable and go, oh, you're, you're gonna be a higher pH than your neighbor over here today because they all fall in a range. How The tomato you grew this year and the one you grew last year and the one you're gonna grow next year are all gonna have slight variations in their pH because of the growing season, the climate, the environment, like that. Um, testing is definitely doable, but home testing is still kind of nebulous. They're getting better with um, 
pH meters and things like that for, for testing your home foods, digital ones. But your best bet, in my mind, is to um, start with knowing where the ranges are. And you can get that information online. It can be kind of hard to track down sometimes. But like I said, the uh, appendixes for pH of various foods, one for vegetables, one for fruits. And you're welcome to come up and, and take a look at these, and I can tell you where the source is. When you do, you'll notice that most of them have a range of numbers. Because if you're looking at, say, let's do one of the foods we've got here. We've got carrots. Carrots have a pH of 4.9 to 5.2 on this chart here. And they can't nail it any closer because where your carrot grew, how long it was in storage, the type of carrot, the soil it was in, the climate that year, all kind of affect those things. So we're all still looking with ranges and numbers. So when we're trying to get it to that 4.6 number, a lot of times what we're doing is we're overshooting just to be sure we're on the safe side. And it's actually kind of a nice thing because it makes you go, okay, I can pickle just about anything as long as I'm willing to overshoot it. Linda Zedrich, who's a pickling, uh, canning and preserving guru, pickling guru, she's been around forever. Um, she points out that if you put equal parts of vinegar and water, you've got something of brine you can pickle just about anything into. And she's got a similar ratio for your salt as well. The important thing there is what you're using for your vinegar. 5% acidity is what you should be working with. If you're making your own vinegars at home, chances are they're not going to be nailing 5%. Use those for your salad dressings and your fresh stuff and your marinades. For your pickling, go out and buy a bottle of, say, 5% acidity on it. And once you do that, mix it equal parts water and vinegar. You've got a brine. That's what I did for the refrigerator pickles. And um, that's probably, I'm, I'd have to look at my recipes for which I did for these ones. But um, for the carrots and cucumbers, especially this jar that has a mixed carrots and cucumbers with two different vegetables and two different pH, the brine's going to be close to that. Now, if I'm going to be canning something, if I'm going to pickle tomatoes, that's going to overshoot my brine for sure because tomatoes are on a different pH mix. But otherwise, I know I'm good to go with what I'm what vinegar did you use then for your quick pickles? Sorry? What did you use for your quick pickles? Uh, for my quick pickles, let me see. What did I do with these ones? I, with the onions, I did equal parts water and vinegar in the quick pickles. Um, and with... Red wine vinegar on that one? Yep, red wine vinegar in these guys to, uh, to go with the color and the flavor. And I do all of my pickling with... Um, let me backtrack and say that. I do none of my pickling with white or distilled vinegar. Um, personally, I think that's great for cleaning. <laughs> say that again. With white or distilled vinegar, I don't, I don't do any of my food preservation with it. I clean my house with it, but um, I find that it's really harsh. It's got everything taken out of it. Um, I prefer a wine vinegar or a cider vinegar with everything I'm going to pickle. And um, they're all, check the labels on the jars, um, when you go to buy it, because they are some that uh, won't have the same percentage, but you're looking for that 5% or higher number. And so I often don't use red wine vinegar because it will color things, but in this case, I wanted these bright, pretty um, red onions to really pop out of the jar. And I was curious to see, since I had, this is the first time I've tried them with the beet on top, I was curious to see how well this would filter down into its color. In, in comparison, when I first set them up, these jars were immediately bright and colorful from the red wine, whereas these ones at the same time. The carrot pickles, I believe I did those. Oh, yep, these ones I did with um, just a little bit of water and mostly vinegar. And I did that for primarily because the vinegar I decided to use for these ones was rice vinegar. Rice vinegar is almost always going to be a 4.2 or 4.3 percent acidity, and you want a 5 percent for your canning, which means you either have to do some math to figure out the balance of water to vinegar, um, or you have to choose a, a different vinegar to stick at that 5 percent number. So, what else so can rice do? vinegar is less acidic? Rice vinegar is, yep, yep, less acidic. I use that for my cucumber. Mm-hmm. So if you're refrigerator. Yep. You know. 
And if you're doing your refrigerator stuff, your quick pickles, your refrigerator pickles, part of the beauty of them is, is they're not gonna sit very long, and when they do, they're sitting in the fridge. So you can start to play with those ratios because you're not preserving them. And you can be like, oh, I wanna find out what I like the taste of. If, you're, if you've got little kids, you're trying to introduce them to pickles, you can do it with just a tiny bit of vinegar because you're not gonna keep them around any longer than you probably would keep around the fresh carrot anyway. But when you go to the canning and preserving, you gotta make sure you're hitting that 5% acidity and the proper balance and ratio in your recipe. So your tested canning recipes will tell you exactly how much to put in there and follow them because they've, they've done that math for you. They've made it easy for you. Can you reuse the plastic lids? Yes, absolutely. That Paul sells them as storage lids for once you've opened your jar of oh. canned goods. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Is kind of how they're selling them. Um, and that's essentially what I'm doing. I'm storing them here. They've just, what's in the jar has never been processed at all. But yeah, I was having trouble with uh, getting rust on them. The yes, I've seen that before with the pickles. Mm -hmm. Yep. The fridge pickles that we had. Yep. Yeah, yeah, getting them on there. And you can buy stainless steel canning rings mm -hmm. to go around your your jars, um, which is good if you're going to be doing a lot of it. But you're, if you're still reusing the lids, then you're kind of prone. And I noticed you don't keep the rings on there. I do not, no. I should have mentioned that in the canning class earlier. Do not keep your rings on your sealed jars when you store them. They aren't doing you any good. Mm -hmm. Your jar is totally sealed. And they could potentially have cause problems because if your jar wasn't completely clean and you've got a, ring, a loose ring on there and you've got a little food under there, now you're going to grow mold on the outside of your jar. On the outside of the jar. Mm -hmm. okay. it's, it's, if your jar is sealed, it won't affect what's inside. Mm -hmm. But if your jar were to come unsealed, then you're introducing that. And you've introduced that into the environment where all your stuff is stored. So yeah, take the rings off as soon as you're as soon as you know those jars have sealed, they've popped down, they aren't coming back up on you. Take the rings off, wash the jars, and put the rings somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So I only put the rings back on once they go in the fridge to, to keep them from spilling. Do you double stack or do you not? I do double stack because I have a 500 square foot house and I don't really have the option. <laughs> it is not advisable. Um, risk of double stacking is one, just things are less stable. But two, you, you can actually, if you've got temperature changes in your storage space and things like that, jars can unseal themselves in storage. And if you double stack it, you might not know it because you've got something weighing it down. So um, that's one of the reasons that they, they say don't double stack because then you definitely know. The reality of it is, is that most of us don't have a kitchen set up unless we've custom built something where we can single stack things. Um, so yes, unfortunately I do double stack. I highly recommend if you can get away without doing it, do so. And if you are gonna double stack it, um, make sure you're keeping an eye on, on what's going on So I work at a food bank mm -hmm. and our customers go crazy when we bring in the, the produce during the summer. Mm -hmm. I, they just, they wait for it. They're so happy. Yeah. But we can't accept any canned goods. Is that ever going to, I mean, I feel so sorry for people that they're spending all this time canning and they happily I mean, come to us and we go. Those kind of cans. We can't take it. Right. Yep, you cannot sure. take home again canned goods. That is probably never going to change, unfortunately. The reasons are are the health reasons. It's it's the same reason that if somebody gifts you a canned good, you sit there as an individual and go, oh, do I trust that that person did it right? Mm -hmm. um, do, is this somebody I know and trust and I want to take their goods? You know, my, my friends are like, oh yes, please give me canned goods. <laughs> but they know that I'm, I'm aware of what I'm doing and, uh, and I'm going to be conscious of it can't always be sure of that um, when things are canned at home because there's no checks and, and testing. Most people canning at home are not testing their produce either, um, testing their pH and their things like that. And I don't test pH. I have a food blog. I put up recipes that um, I have studied and adapted, but they're all based on the math and the numbers and somebody else's math and figures because home pH testing is still nebulous enough that I don't know that you can trust it any better than, than what you're going to get out of following the, the tested recipes and doing the math and the know-how. 
So um, the problem is, is that everybody's kind of on their honor. And there's no way a food bank or things like that are going to accept it. So the best thing that I can think of, and I know there, I believe it's down in Missoula or Livingston, they're doing it with their food center where they're teaching classes and workshops oh. and teaching people how to do their own preserving and canning. And that's well, part of the reason I do workshops. Is well, Danny has that shape the food processing center. Mm -hmm. They might teach there. Yeah, they might do some there, and I think they've got they've got it tied. I think it's down in Livingston where it's tied to the food bank, um, and they're they're getting people in and, and teaching classes. And to my mind, that's the best thing is to to teach people to you know, to preserve their own. And then they've, it's all part of this community food system we've been talking about as well. Then they've got a vested interest in, in what they're doing and they're taking a, learning a skill rather than just taking something off the shelf. So, yeah, I wish it would change, but unfortunately. That's true. <laughs> when you water bath can, are you diluting the vinegar for those also? Um, it depends on what I'm canning. So, um, like I said, so the... You're taking uh, a 5% solution and adding... Yep. Half the water yep. Equal down. equal water and five percent vinegar mm -hmm. is for just about everything is going to be safe to process and pickle with. Um, that being said, there are a few things where you're looking at those numbers um, and you're going to want to be careful with them. And um, it also depends on what you're putting in your jar as well. You know, you look at these jars here. I got a bunch of seeds and herbs and things that are going on in this jar. And this one's got a bunch of peppers, it's got cucumbers, it's got carrots. So all of a sudden I've changed the pH in my jar from just what my carrot number was, the 4.9 to 5.2, because my peppers, my garlic, my ginger, all of that is also low acid. Um, so your best bet if you are going to, if you're just starting to pickle and can, is follow a tested recipe. That's something that's going to come from the USDA, it's going to come from the National Center for Food Preservation. And when I say follow, I do mean follow. They've figured out the math and the numbers that are going to keep all those things safe, particularly when you're starting. If you want to start changing what goes into the jar as far as I'm going to add this flavor or that flavor or I, I really want to can this particular thing, you either need to learn enough to know that you're safe, 100% knowledge that you're safe in doing it, or you need to find somebody who has done that process for you. And the internet's a big thing. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. So you really have to be the one who's doing that, that thinking through and processing if you're going to go that route. Um, does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> what else we got? So I talk math, I talk numbers, I talk pickles. I can tell you a few more things about what's sitting up here. First of all, I can tell you this is not a pickle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As you probably noticed. Um, I wanted to bring stuff to demo today with the same vegetables so you could see what was going on in the different jars and realize, oh, I haven't actually pickled onions and processed them alone in their own jar. I just add them to everything else. And then when I want pickled onions, I've got a jar of dill pickles or whatever else that's got onions and things that are, have been balanced into the recipe. This is actually a um, apple red onion marmalade. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it's got onions. It's totally... So it's just apple and red onion? Apple, red onion. The apple is work. It's got it's got sugar and other things going on in there. It's a marmalade. Um, some citrus in there. The citrus and the apple are working as your pectin and firming it up. So it's going to be a little bit different than uh, than your pickled jars. And these guys, of course, are all full of <coughs> liquidy mix for the pickles. This jar over here is a little bit different as well. You can see it's quite cloudy. And the reason for that is this is a quick refrigerator pickle. I just did it in the fridge, and uh, I was trying a new recipe. And the recipe calls for ground spices. So if you look at this guy, pretty bright and clear. It's got all those whole spices in there. As soon as you get into the ground spices, they're not going to dissolve in there. They're going to keep that thing looking cloudy in it. So it's your choice about whether I'm going to use whole spices, whether I'm going to use ground spices. The advantage of the ground 
for the refrigerator pickles and the quick pickles is the flavor is there and it's distributed immediately. If you do a quick pickle and you put in whole spices, you're going to get a hit of whole spice mm -hmm. and then no spice because you're eating the thing in 30 minutes. Um, the disadvantage is, of course, the cloudiness. The one that I know of that's really well known for canning that they do that is mustard beans. Um, if you've ever had mustard beans, they look like they're in this kind of cloudy brine because they're doing ground mustard inside there. Um, and I much prefer to put in a mustard seed um, if I'm going to do anything that's going in a, in a canner to get that flavor. But um, that's kind of the nature of that particular style of, of pickle. It's a sweet bean pickle where it's got the mustard and the sugar and it gets that kind of grind in it. So that's the difference here. Otherwise, these guys are just as fresh as these ones here. They were all made at the same time. It's just that, that brine and that hmm. powder. Yeah? Uh, did you say you've got a blog? I do, yep. And do you have these recipes on, up on that blog? I have some of these on that blog. And on the blog, you will find recipes for some of these guys. Let me see. Barely fermented carrots are definitely on the blog. Um, quick pickles I've written about on the blog, and they're kind of in general of you can do them with just about anything. So you'll find some quick pickling instructions, but not necessarily for these combinations. So yeah, some of them are up there. Some of them are on their way up. I usually post uh, a couple recipes uh, every week in, uh, in my blog posts, so it goes up there. And I do everything from sourdough to fermenting to meals and all that. So there's a lot of variety. Do you have any experience, but I'm going to guess that those expensive $50 fermenting lids are no more effective than your little $3 beer lock? You know, um, I'm, I'm about to write to one of those companies and say, hey, I have a food blog. You want to send me one to give it a try? Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, you, what I have, I have not experienced with the, uh, the super expensive ones. Um, what I have been reading lately, though, is there's some that people are really excited about because they're all built in one unit with the weight and the airlock and everything like that. Um, I would say do do what find do what will get you started for sure. Um, people used to think, oh, I need a big pickling crock in order to do pickles, and they're awesome for pickling. But these days, they're collector items to find one, and particularly one that's not cracked. Um, I do all of my ferments in jars. I usually do half gallon jars for my, my bigger ferments, but they'll take any of these lids on them. When you've got them, part of the advantage of the crock is that it's dark when you're doing your ferment. Wrap them in a towel, and the towel also clues you into whether your ferment is starting to bubble up and over and, uh, and stuff as you're going, because it'll start to get wet along the bottom. So. Did you put those plastic lids on top of one of the do you have that one little spot? Yeah, See what's on there? Nope. It's just the lid. Lid straight on there. Yep. I'll take one. So you don't ever put one of those spot ones on there? Wouldn't need to. Yep. Yeah, these are full lids. They're meant to be replacements rather than just adding a, a ring around the outside. But then you're not really worried about the food around the, the ring now? It's just storage. It's just storage in the fridge. Oh. Yeah, yep, mm -hmm. yep. So yeah, these are, we're talking, these are going to sit on my shelf for a year, mm -hmm. and they're going to sit at room temperature, whereas these guys are going to be in the fridge. Uh -huh. And um, yeah, if I go into them and I and you use them, you know, this one, it'll, I don't know if I have been in and out of it enough. You get some color and some mm -hmm. liquid up top there and stuff. So you can change it, you can wash it out and things as you need to. But um, mostly, I'm. I'm just dipping in there. I'm not going to get any additional food products in there. I always try when I have pickles, and particularly fermented ones, if I'm going to dip into a jar to take out for anything, use fresh utensil, clean utensil. Try not to introduce anything into the jar. Um, ferments, even though they're in the fridge, they're, they're just kind of sleeping. They're still working. Um, you're asking about the yeast. You can get your, if you're in the jar, in the fridge a long time, that yeast can continue to develop. And that's because they're still fermenting in the fridge. They're just doing it really slowly. So avoid introducing any other particles in there. What do we think, everybody? <laughs> I think we might be good. Thank you guys so much for coming out. Thank you. And thank you for your blog. Oh, you're welcome.